The script that's written in our genes directs us from behind the scenes. The words within it shape life's destiny. Hidden in your DNA is your genetic dossier. It tells your future and your history. How traits get passed from parents to a child is something that has kept us so beguiled. Cracking the code. Genetic mysteries to unfold. Cracking the code. Genetic secrets will be told. Cracking the code. Genetic mysteries to unfold. Cracking the code. Genetic secrets will be told. Cracking the code. By the 1980s, scientists were able to hunt down the faulty genes that cause classic genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and pinpoint their DNA errors. But it took years of painstaking work to hunt down a single such gene, even after narrowing the search to a small bit of one chromosome. Francis Collins was one of the scientists hunting for the cystic fibrosis gene. Going down blind alleys, finding yourself in a situation that nobody had ever faced before, landing in territory on a chromosome that nothing was known about. It was incredibly frustrating. An idea then arose. Why not read out our entire book of life, the human genome? All the A's, G's, C's, and T's in every chromosome, about three billion in total. This would reveal once and for all the location and sequence of every human gene. Instead of rummaging in the dark through the actual chromosomes, gene hunters would be able to search through a computer list of all the genes needed to create a human being. There's no other way available of establishing that list, and so it, it really is um, critically important for understanding human biology because you're not going to understand an automobile fully unless you know all the parts. The complete book of life would also spell out the much larger spaces between genes and often within genes that don't code for proteins but which must hold the many secrets of gene regulation. How genes interact with each other in complex patterns and how some get turned on or off as a single fertilized egg develops into the many specialized tissues of an adult human. Our genome could also be compared to the genomes of other creatures, which would tell the story of our evolution. The inspiration for what became known as the Human Genome Project actually came from one of the lowliest of creatures, a one millimeter long roundworm or nematode, which had been chosen as a new model organism for genetics. It was chosen by Sidney Brenner, who now wanted to solve the puzzle of development. What he needed was an animal complex enough to have a nervous system, yet small enough to fit under an electron microscope. And it would have to be an animal that displayed the essence of the problem, namely started with an egg, and after development gave us many, many cells. Brenner's new model organism soon attracted other scientists. One of them was John Sulston, who spent years studying the development of every cell in the adult worm. But there was a bottleneck because physically you could not um, isolate the genes themselves as pieces of DNA very fast. You wanted to guess at the work search you're seeing. And people would uh, sort of come along to his research students and they'd spend three years just getting hold of one gene. Sulston thought the best way to speed up this process was to put together a genetic map of the worm which by now had been adopted by many labs around the world. The genetic map was pioneered almost a century ago in the fruit fly by Thomas Hunt Morgan and his students. They used mutations as markers for genes and located them on a chromosome based on how closely one mutation is linked to another during germ cell production. Hunting genes is a competitive sport but a genetic map works best when competitors become collaborators.
And if everybody is open with their information, then every time somebody gets hold of a gene, that is accumulated and creates a new marker. So the thing automatically gets richer and richer and more powerful as, as it goes along. To speed up the process even further, they decided to read out or sequence the entire genome. At 100 million bases, it was by far the largest ever tackled. And it strengthened the scientific resolve to sequence the 3,000 million bases in our genome. Instead of picking around the edges of the human genome, little bits at a time, maybe we ought to mount an effort to just do the whole thing and do it as fast as we could and as efficiently as we could. And it took a few years for that idea uh, to reach enough you know, support to actually become realistic. There's three billion base pairs in the haploid human genome, and it likely cost us one dollar a base pair to sequence, so that's a three billion dollar project. And some people said, uh, gee, that's a lot of money. Uh, maybe we should just focus on that 5% of the DNA which contains the genes. The problem is we can't pick out in advance of having the whole DNA sequence which bits of DNA are genes, and so you have to do the whole sequence. First the U.S. Department of Energy and then the National Institutes of Health took up the challenge. In 1988, Congress decided to fund the Human Genome Project. It was expected to last at least 15 years, making it the equivalent in biology to the space program. An early decision was to also make it an international project, so an international meeting was called. The key thing we established then was that all the data will be released immediately or as soon as practical from our computers. And this, you remember, this is exactly what we did with the worm map some years earlier. About a third of the sequencing took place in Cambridge, England, at the Sanger Centre, which was now headed by John Solston. Early on, it was also decided that, as with the worm, the human genome had to be fully mapped before it could be sequenced. In addition to the traditional genetic map, a physical map was also constructed. This consists of the chromosomes themselves chopped up into thousands of pieces, each of which is then cloned within a bacterial culture. When put back into order, they form a living library of the genome, which can be physically mapped using landmarks within the DNA itself as markers. The next step is to sequence all the DNA in all the clones. The traditional method of sequencing DNA uses radioactive tags spread across four columns, one for each different base. Then this sequence is read out manually. Using this tedious technology, it would have taken a thousand labs a full century or more to sequence the human genome. In 1993, Francis Collins became head of the project. You had to sort of make a plan without having a clear pathway in front of you and hope that if you stimulated the technology, it would appear at the right moment. By the mid-1990s, a highly automated machine using laser beams to sequence DNA tagged with fluorescent colors was able to read over 10,000 bases an hour. Each of the four colors represents a different base. The DNA must be read in small bits, about 500 bases long. So each clone must first be shattered into hundreds of tiny fragments. This is repeated several times, producing a different set of fragments each time. A computer then compares all of them, looking for identical bits of sequence. Using these overlaps, it is able to put together long strings of letters. Then these strings are positioned relative to each other by lining their markers up against those in the previously completed maps. And then the other important thing is, of course, in DNA sequencing, you acquire huge amounts of data. And very luckily, at the same time, the capacity of computers to absorb data and handle it has been increasing at about the same rate as that at which we've been acquiring new DNA sequence data. So there's been a, a marvelous uh, synergy between computer technology and hardware development and, and the amount of data that we have to handle in that way. So actually, we couldn't have sequenced the human genome any earlier because the computers weren't powerful enough a decade earlier to either store